The other day, I wanted to cook dinner. But to cook dinner, I needed to go to the grocery store. So I go to the grocery store and I come back with the groceries. Now I need to unload the groceries into the kitchen. But there's a bunch of stuff on the counter that's in the way. And one of these things is the blender and the blender belongs in the basement on a shelf. And so I put the groceries on the floor and I pick up the blender and I take it to the basement. But between me and the shelf, there's a whole bunch of crap. And I'm being safe here, so rather than step over the crap, I put the blender down on the floor and I pick up the stuff and I start carting it up to the attic where it belongs. And I'm running up and down the stairs and my husband is like, I thought you were gonna cook dinner. And I'm like, what does it look like I'm doing? This might be yak shaving. And then, and then after I get the groceries put away, I'm gonna need to look up the recipe. And when I look up the recipe, I've gotta find it in my email and I open my email and oh, there's something that reminds me of an appointment I have tomorrow and I'm gonna need the car, so I better talk to my husband right now. And then who knows where that conversation goes and meanwhile, the milk is still on the counter. Um, if my husband's cooking dinner, he might get to the part in the recipe where it says, uh, beat the egg whites until stiff. And he's like, what does that mean? And so he looks it up on the internet. How do you beat egg whites until stiff? And he might find out that the most effective way to do that is with a copper bowl and a balloon whisk. And if he stops what he's doing and goes to the fancy kitchen store to buy those things, he is definitely yak shaving. Yak shaving is an expression that means all the little fiddly tasks that don't look like they're directly related to what you're doing, but they are. They're either in the way or they're gonna make you better at what you're doing. Uh, yak shaving is kind of a weird expression. It doesn't actually matter what phrase you use for this as long as it makes you say, why would you do that? So I think we do a lot of this in work uh, because as developers, we control our own world. So there's the world of the computer. So there's always something we could do to make our work better or smoother or just more entertaining. And some of these are yak shaves that we should really drop and maybe somebody else can clean up the basement later. Um, but some of them are really important and we need to find the balance. So I wanted to write a talk about yak shaving in general and how do we categorize these and um, and, and decide which ones are important and which ones to drop. So in order to do that, I was like, well, I, yaks are funny. Uh, Kent talked in the keynote about goats. I get to talk about yaks, that's cool. Uh, so I did some research and I found this amazing website, yakbreeder.com. This website is awesome. It's like so late 90s, it's amazing. This is my new favorite website. They really, really love yaks. The Tibetan yak is the ideal animal to meet your needs. It will make you more money, time after time. Real growth opportunities exist. And I think that's true because some of the yaks that we shave, some of these little tasks that we derail and do are growth opportunities. Also, highly conveniently, I have five categories of programming yak shaves. And yakbreeder.com sells five breeds of yak. And I swear, I titled this presentation Shaving the Golden Yak before I ever found this website. I did not know that in fact, golden yak is a species of yak. And it's the best one. Just wait, just wait till you hear about the golden yak because all the quotes in this presentation, unless otherwise attributed, come from yakbreeder.com. Okay, so the first kind of yak to think about in terms of development work is the black yak, which I call the attack yak. And these are the yaks that you can't get past. They are in your way and you have to fix them. This is not optional. This is the build is broken. It's merge conflicts. It's the linter hates you if the lint breaks your build. Um, it's code review, more on that in a minute, um, or the tests, tests failing, like flaky tests, or uh, test setup, and that's separate, because it's like I need to test this to do some checks in like an integration test environment, and that can be really hard to set up and really painful, but all of these are things that you have to do to get your job done responsibly. Now, there's one more uh, that we don't always think about as a yak, but it's, it's the huh? It's the, 
I don't even know what this feature means. It's the, I don't understand what this code is doing. It's the, what is this word? It's the, wait, you need me to understand Nginx configuration? <laughs> Um, and so we hit a lot of these, and they're also attack yaks in the sense that to do our job responsibly, we don't need to guess what that feature is. We really need to go find out. And those, in fact, are my favorite attack yaks. More on the learning in a bit. Uh, but I want to zoom in on some of these others because other than the questioning one, these are all yaks that we set up for ourselves. We inflicted this linter on ourselves. We wrote these automated tests. This is not uh, something that happened to us. We chose this for a reason. So we need to be careful when we do that. In particular, uh, to zoom in on a couple of these tests, the job of test is to prevent change. The job of a developer is usually to make change. So, so this can be in conflict and we need to be careful about which tests we automate and enshrine in our build process. Test the places where you want to prevent change. So at any external API, that's totally a place we don't want to accidentally change. Uh, but your internal class structure, if your, your unit tests are too fine-grained, if they're at like the class unit instead of like the, the module or API level, they can really get in the way and prevent refactoring. And flaky tests, oh my gosh, please kill those. Um, another one that I, is a pet peeve of mine is code review. Code review is a total attack yak, and it really bothers me. First of all, straight out, pairing is better. If your objective is for quality code and for more than one person on the team to be involved, please, pairing is like live code review in context. Because what I hate about code review is that I think a feature is done, I ship it off, and then later, hours or days later, somebody's like, oh, I think you should add a test case. Oh, I don't understand what this variable name is. Yo, you don't understand it because you weren't there. Um, that's fine. That's fine. If you have a better name, if you want another test case, frickin' add it yourself and push a commit to the branch and I will thank you for your contribution because I hate having to context switch back to this old thing that is such a yak. Okay, the other re really good reason to do code reviews is uh, some people use it to keep the team up to date on the state of the code so that everybody knows what's going on. Totally valid goal. Don't put it in my yak stack. Um, uh, on our team, each member of the team, uh, when we get to work, we do a quick um, check on all the code that went in. I can look at your code that goes in. You don't have to wait for that. Um, so, so yes, do share information about the code. But if you're not going to have a conversation, then we, this can be asynchronous. And that's fine, because we do, we look at all the code. Right. So the trick with the attack yaks, you can't not defeat them, but you can be careful which ones you put in front of yourselves and each other. So be careful which attack yaks you summon and think consciously about that. And then when they do get in your way, it's time to think about different ways to accomplish that same objective that the yak had. Maybe you can automate your linters. Uh, we do that. Maybe uh, maybe you don't need code reviews. Oh, maybe we need to fix those flaky tests or maybe think carefully about which tests and select some to delete and some to rewrite at a higher level kind of thing. Uh, but you need to know which ones are really getting in your way before you decide to coordinate your defense and fix them really well. Uh, one way that I track the yaks, track the attack, I like to track the attack yak in Slack. <laughs> so I have this little a yak emoji, a tack yak emoji that I can use um, to complain <laughs> or just to track when one of these things gets in my way. And then uh, if you have infrequent retros, like less than once a day, uh, a problem with that is that what comes to mind in the retro is just what got in your way in the last day or two. But if I go before the retro and I search for the attack yak in Slack, then I can get a broader set of data of what has really bothered me and the rest of my team if they're tracking their attack yaks in Slack um, and, and get a better idea of how we want to fix it. And then we go back to coordinate your defense, which means make this a real task. Um, in, in development, you can try to aim for fast. But if you aim to get things done as fast as possible, you will become slow. 
Because each of those things you do quickly leaves you in a state that is not conducive to doing things quickly later. But if you aim for smooth, you will achieve fast, and it'll be sustainable, and it'll stay fast. So coordinate your defense as a real task. OK, one of your stories this, this sprint is to investigate these flaky tests and like really figure out what's going on there. Sometimes they have an interesting message for you about concurrency in your system. Uh, but it's going to take effort, so make those decisions together and work together on those. The next breed of yak is the imperial yak, also known as the yak stack. And this might start out as an attack yak, but then uh, the, bill, the test is flaky, and what is this test? And I've got to go find somebody to ask about that. And it just keeps going and getting further and further. Uh, for example, my teammate Rod, one day, one Saturday, he just wanted to introduce this quick feature that he thought would like, he would like to have in one of our um, tools. And so he's working along and having a good time, and he's got 10 tests, and he's got them passing, and then he writes the 11th, and then it fails for the wrong reason. And he's like, what is going on here? So first he's got to answer the questions. And then after that, he found out that it was a bug in a library. And now he could have like tried to work around it, but he recognized that while what Rod was doing was just this feature that he personally wanted and found fun to implement, this bug in the library was going to impact the work of Clay on Monday, and Clay was in the critical path for the project. So Rod stopped what he was doing, checked out the library, uh, set up his environment to be able to test it, wrote a test, made the fix, pushed this, uh, got, then he needs a code review and a release before he can get back to what he was doing. and. Um, and in this case, that was, that was worthwhile because the bug in the library was actually more urgent than what he was doing. And so uh, I did the code review, and Sylvan jumped in and did the release. And by Monday, Clay's work was smooth, at least. Well, OK, this particular pothole was out of his way. But that's a, that's a whole stack of yaks that get in the way. Uh, for another example, um, not long afterward, I was coding something, and I wrote a test, and it failed for the wrong reason. I didn't understand what was going on. And it turned out that I was using the library wrong. Um, but this, this is our library, and it's an open source library. And so after I spent half an hour figuring out how I'm actually supposed to use the library, I paused my work, checked out the library, put in a really useful error message. In fact, I've read somewhere the other day that we should replace the phrase error message with help and guidance message. <laughs> because, I mean, I want my users of my library to succeed. I want future me to succeed and my team to succeed. And so I need to not just fail cryptically. I need to fail informatively. So I changed that error message. Error messages are really hard to test. Uh, because the setup is like wrong and it's sometimes certain wrong setups are really hard to duplicate in a test and like not even worth it because honestly I don't feel the need to prevent change in that area. So it's important to stop and while I have the error set up, put in the error message, link it up in my environment, see the error message. So it's a check. It's, it's not an automated test, but I'm testing it locally. And then I, I don't actually have to wait for the, the code review or the release or anything. It can just roll in with other stuff. Because now I know that I've smoothed out that pothole for the future. I can go on, pop the yak stack, and get back to work. The trick with yak stacks is you have to prioritize. In Rod's case, uh, the, the yak was more important than what he was doing, so he just redirected and fixed, uh, uh, went as deep as he needed to to get that fixed. In my case, um, if the task I was working on was urgent, I would not have stopped and spent the extra 30 to 60 minutes fixing the error message. I would have made an issue, stuck a flag in that pothole, and moved on. A pairing, again, really helps because it helps when you're asking yourself, how do I prioritize among these yaks, if you have someone who's deep in the details and someone who can still remember why we're doing this at all. I like that. Uh, the next thing is, again, to track them. Because um, sometimes I get so deep in, in the yak stack that I forget what I was even doing, especially when I'm not pairing. So when I'm not pairing, I'll often write in my Jessitron stream in Slack. At Atomist, everybody has a Slack channel that's just like a notebook. 
that you can keep track of what you're doing and vent some frustrations. And then when I do have a question for people, I can at them in my channel and they can pop in and have some context. Also, it's really useful for reference. So often I'll track my yak stack in here and then I can, I can check them off with a little green check mark react G and, and feel productive even though I'm like six yaks down from what I was really trying to do. That's okay. Uh, sometimes I track the yak stack on paper because I really like markers and this is satisfying. So when I'm working alone, I will like, here's the thing I wanted to do and then the first step and then a step and then a step and then, a, oh, a WTF, what the heck happened here? And so we're veering off into, into new yak territory. And then the stack gets longer and it gets longer. <laughs> and one thing to realize, sometimes you just say, stop it and you like leave the yaks in the field, revert back to master, and, and maybe ask somebody else, okay, how important was this anyway, and what's another way we could accomplish it? So don't get too attached to the yaks. Sometimes you just gotta let them free. And finally, um, when, when you're thinking about which yaks, go a little farther to clear the path for the future, for future you, for your team in the future, and um, if it's open source for your, all your users in the future, or if you have customers. Um, I, that, that like error message stuff, or also uh, fixing the documentation, improving the readme, all of these little things, they, they get a bonus yak. They are the neon yak of glory because while th they don't help present you, they help everyone in the future. They smooth the past and make the past? No, the path. They smooth the path so that your future team can move faster and not hit this pothole again. I think that's really important uh, because if you're focused on individual productivity, if your only incentive is your individually attributable impact, then why would you do this? Why would you care about your future teammates experience? And I think it's wrong to focus on productivity, on how many tickets did I personally close? I mean, maybe you want to look at that, but, and I guess from the keynote this morning, I'm in the, I'm in the extract phase of where we want to make good decisions. Um, I don't want to evaluate people. My contribution is not measured by the tickets I personally closed. It's measured by my impact on the whole team and the team's outcomes, because we are in this together. So this word generativity, I pulled this out of the Journal of Occupational and Organizational Psychology. And I define it as the difference in my team's outcomes with me versus without me. And not just today, but over time sustainably. Uh, so everything that I do to improve the readme or an error message, this is generativity. And you can, you can detect this. Measurement is really hard, but detection we can do by just asking the other people, on the, everyone on the team, who helped you? What was useful to you? What error message was great this week? And, and that makes a big difference when you just, even just having a word for it, I think helps of why I want to shave these neon yaks. Okay, yak number three, the trim yak. Now, I named this the hack hacking yak largely because it's really fun to say, <coughs> but also because as I was doing my yak research, I came across this definition, which is about life hacks. Life hacks are these little scripts that you write and these systems that you set up to avoid yak shaving. I'm like, no, those are yak shaves. Hello. You, you wanted to get your email read, but you're spending time setting up a system to sort your email. That is a yak shave and it's a really useful one. Now, since we're programmers, and I think the word life hack is really sad, um, we used to call those household hints. Um, Anyway, since we're programmers and so we're hackers, they're, they're hack hacks. See, we, we change the way we do our own work. So the trim yaks are specifically kind of personal. They're about how do I personally make my own work smoother, faster, or better. So this is things like setting up macros in your IDE or aliases in your bash profile in a Linuxy system. Um, it's learning a tool. It's like 
okay, I really want to understand Nginx so I can, so every time in the future I can know what the, this config means. Um, so it can be reading, especially reading code. Uh, refactoring, I want to call out in particular, because as developers, we're not paid for what we do. Our limitation is not what we do. We're paid for what we know how to do. Our limitation is how much we can know. You can tell because we don't sit there typing all day, and most of what we type, we delete. Our job is not typing code, it's deciding what code should be in the system. And making good decisions takes a lot of knowledge, especially knowledge of the system you're working in. One way to get a really good grasp on how the code works and fits together is to refactor it. One way to destroy the mental model all your team has of the code is for you to refactor it. So, I mean, sometimes your team is like, oh my god, thank you, that's so much better. In which case, yes, please commit that refactor. You've, you've smoothed the path for people, good job. But sometimes they're like, uh, okay, I guess that still works because the test passed. Delete that. You accomplished something by doing the refactor. You loaded the code into your head. By the time you've completed that, you understand not only the way you made it work, but the way it worked before to get from one to the other. So delete the refactor, it's fine. That was a useful yak. Time box it, don't take too long at it, but it's, it's, it helps you learn the system. Um, personal automation, I want to go into some examples on this because I think it's underrated. Automation is not about saving you steps. It's not about saving you time. The steps matter because they save you attention. They save you how much you have to load into your head or keep loaded in your finger memory in order to accomplish something. So, uh, for instance, I tend to clone a lot of repositories. Uh, we, we automate project creation, that's one of our, our things, so I wind up creating and cloning a lot of repositories. Not weird. Uh, so I, and that took three steps, because I need to go to the directory where it belongs, and then I need to get clone, and remember the secret URL of GitHub, and then I need to CD into that directory, which I always forget and is annoying. Um, so that's three steps. Why would you bother automating those? Well, I did anyway. I mean, it's just a, a little function, my bash profile, to do the get, and then I can type where it is, and it does those three steps, and also, but then, the thing is, once you've done that automation, you have offloaded some knowledge from your head and you've put it in the world. You don't have to keep it in your head anymore, but it's even better because it's often easier to change knowledge in the world than in your head. And I can use this to make my job smoother and safer. And I mean safety in the sense of Nancy Levison, it's not just, um, people getting injured. I want to be safe from frustration. Even the little things, because whenever I clone a node project, and then I open it in VS Code, and then there's all these red squigglies under the imports, I'm like, oh, I didn't run npm install. And instead of being like, Jess, you're so stupid, you didn't run npm install. No, I'm going to change the system. I'm going to put that knowledge into the world, because I have a, I have a hook there. That, that function that I wrote, that bash function, is a hook where I can add new knowledge without having to retrain myself. So it, it just looks for package.json, if there is one, it runs npm install, great, nice. I can do more than safety from frustration, I can save myself from embarrassment because there's been multiple times when I, I tried to do a git push, or I did a git push, and then I went on to something else, and then I find out much later when somebody's like, where's that fix you made, or worse, they've introduced a conflict, thank you. Um, uh, that I didn't succeed at the push at all. It failed and I wasn't notified. Um, and th there's two things actually, also, or I accidentally pushed to master. Uh, so those two things have been embarrassing. Push to master on like one of our open source projects when I meant a branch, e -e -e. I can fix both of those because I have this hook into my knowledge in the world. Um, so yeah, so whenever I clone a repo that's in our open source org, it adds a git hook that if I wanna push to master, I have to say no really, push to master. Um, and, and then if my push fails, oh actually I had to retrain myself on this one to use an alias GP for git push, uh, but once I did that, I was able to make it check the return value and if it failed, it pops up a little box and I have to click ratfish. 
in order to continue my work. So I don't lose that. And both of these save me from embarrassment by changing the system that I work in instead of just feeling stupid. The trick with these yaks, because there's infinitely many of them we can do, is to time box them. Stick with what you know worked. So the first time I failed at get push, I just felt stupid. And the second time, I started to get frustrated with myself. And the third time, I'm like, can I make this pop a box? And it turned out to be hard. Apple Script is a programming language that tries to read like English, which means it's a terrible, terrible programming language. And it's really hard. So I, you know, I gave it 15 minutes. And when I couldn't get it done in 15 minutes, I was like, let it go. But the fourth time, I gave it half an hour and cumulative with the previous 15 minutes, I managed to make the ratfish pop up. And so my system is better. Or if, if, if somebody else has the same problem, I might give it half a day because then it's going to help more than me. The point is to stick with what you know you're gonna use because you've used it. Don't make an IDE macro the first time it would be useful. Wait until the fourth or fifth time you really want to type that. Otherwise, you'll just forget about it and never use it anyway. So stick with proven usefulness, put it in the time box. Uh, the other thing to do is when the yak that you're shaving is learning, when you're answering the attack yak of, huh? Go a little farther because learning, you'll never regret that. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't add code to your legacy system or, any, or mess up anybody's models. And in particular, um, you have to learn the tech um, yes, I want to know Nginx configuration. Well, okay, now I, yeah, I still want to know that. I haven't achieved it yet, but that's okay. Um, the, so learn the tech, but more importantly, learn the system you work in because that is the crucial knowledge and it is the hardest to acquire. No one outside the company can acquire this. And finally, learn the business. So you can know why you're doing this, and that is huge. And when you have to go talk to a business person about what is this feature anyway, go a little deeper, get a little history. Just go, go give it 15 minutes more than you would have otherwise, and you never know when that's gonna help you. That is totally one of those, um, one of those concave things that Kent was talking about in the keynote. Extremely cheap, sometimes huge payoff. Spend a little extra time learning. And finally, Spread the benefits. Don't keep this stuff to yourself when you do learn it. Blog about it. More than once, I've Googled a question and Google has kindly taken me to my own blog post from five years ago. And I'm like, wow, thanks, past me. <laughs> that was really helpful. If nothing else, I'll post it in Slack with a little reference emoji so I can search for it and find the <sighs> how to Docker run so that it actually works yet again. Um, and, and then, uh, if it's something that's shared with your teammates, put it in the README. And then you can do what Peter Hilton calls README-driven development, which is where you start <laughs> putting the steps in the README, which is kind of like programming for the human runtime. And then it gets complicated enough that you're like, screw it, I'm just going to write a bash script. And so then you have it documented in code, which is ac ac accurate because it's executed. Uh, yeah, so that, that can help you with your automations. But what you don't want to do is keep this stuff to yourself so that you can be faster. If you do that, you're not yak shaving, you are yak racing. <laughs> and I've worked with people like this who would learn clever Unix tricks and then hide their copy of Unix in a nutshell so no one else could know. So they would look faster than their friends. And I don't work with those people now, and I hope I never do again. Because yak shaving or yak racing, it may look fun, but I promise you, these people have broken lots of bones. <laughs> OK, yak number four is the royal yak, also known as the yakety yak. And this one, this one is about talking to people. It's not about coding at all. Because talking to people is not a waste of time. When we're pairing and we get off on chit chat, that is developing a communication channel and a level of comfort that's really important. I mean, especially talking to people about the system that you're working in and learning about that, but also just forging those connections. Uh, this is really important because the, the first universal law of software development is Conway's law, that the design 
of your system, like your architecture, the breakdown into subsystems, mirrors the communication structure of your organization. And some people approximate this with the org chart, but the org chart is less and less representative of the communication structure. We talk to people. Uh, and this is, this is, I mean, it's, it's not only observed, it's necessary. Because if your service is closely uh, related and depends strongly on this other service, and those teams, you don't know anyone on that team, you're going to have problems. It depends what we know, and we need to be able to transfer that information. So establishing the communication structure that matches the architecture of your organization, of your um, software, is really important. If it doesn't already exist, but it probably does, because this is deterministic both ways. So you need to talk to people. And uh, when I start a new job that has a physical office, I like to hang out in the coffee room in those, those early days when you're waiting for your computer and, and nothing works anyway. And also your email inbox is empty because you don't have enough knowledge to be important yet. I'll hang out in the coffee room. And when I meet people, I always want to know uh, what, what do they know? What are they good at? Because if you find that person who's good at Nginx configuration, oh, that is really valuable. Because later, you'll go ask them about it. And they'll be like, oh, God, let me tell you about that. And so not only will you get the answer, you'll also make a friend. Because it's a weird thing. If, if someone helps you, they think of you more as your friend. Because you owe them one, and they like that feeling. <laughs> so I owe a lot of people favors. And so I have more friends. It's kind of weird. But that's totally a thing. And uh, you know, find out what they implemented so they can have the, where you can find the history. All reasons are historical reasons. Some of them are still valid. And if you can investigate those, that's really precious. So the things to establish in, in the royal yak work is who knows what and who needs to know what. Whose mental model are you messing up when you change a piece of code? And who is going to be responsible for that and needs to know about the change? Uh, that's part of what we have to do in a team is model not only our software, but also we need a mental model of everybody else's mental model. A little bit more on this in the keynote tomorrow. But it's really hard. But it's helpful to know what other people are going to want to be informed about. That will also make you friends, or at least prevent enemies. And finally, I want everybody to know that I am interested in what they have to say. I want to hear their ideas. I want to hear their questions. If they're frustrated with my library, I want to know about it. And I'm not going to tell them, you're using, them, you're using it wrong. That's stupid. I'm going to tell them, oh my gosh, thank you. Let me go add a help and guidance message for that. <laughs> and when you establish that you do really want to know, you really want to hear from everyone, then you get psychological safety. And which there's a study by Google that they did an internal study of other teams. And they figured out that the number one determining factor of an effective team had nothing to do with how smart the people were. It had to do with psychological safety. It had to do with when, when a team member knew something, they could tell everyone and they didn't have to fear. They weren't all sitting there worrying about their individually accountable impact. What was that phrase? Yeah. And psychological safety, it's once you realize that, that like what our limitation is what we know and not what we do, this makes complete sense. Because, oh, Kent had one of these in his presentation too. There's a growth loop here. Psychological safety increases our learning from each other. And when we learn from each other, that increases our psychological safety, our comfort in learning from each other. So this is a virtuous cycle that you really want. OK, finally, it's time. It's time for the golden yak. And yakbreeder.com just goes on and on about the extremely rare golden yak. Apparently, there's only like 120 of them in the world. And half of those are only available from yakbreeder.com. <laughs> and it goes on and on about how amazingly beautiful it is. When the fading rays of sun at dusk bounce off the coat of one of these magnificent, rare, golden animals, it is a wondrous sight to behold. And I'm looking at the pictures, and I'm like, it's brown. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice, warm brown, but it's brown. So, so I like to think that, that this one, if you shave it really well and carefully underneath, 
you'll find its golden skin that will, in fact, reflect the rays of the sun at dusk. And this one, metaphorically, the golden yak is the yak that if you shave it well enough, and there's not going to be any reason to shave it well enough. You're never going to be able to justify that with a return on investment. If you shave this one well enough, you find that it changes a lot more than you ever expected. It really changes the way you work. And if you release it into the wild, it might change the way the whole world works. Canonical example, Git. So Torvalds had his own problem that he needed to solve with his version control system. But uh, it turned out to be a problem that everybody had and needed solutions for, how to better collaborate on a version control code base. Um, and this, most of the golden yaks, uh, they make huge change because they create a virtuous cycle or a growth loop. And in the case of Git, uh, I noticed one, one of the virtual cycles, not the only one in Git, was that with Subversion, um, the logs weren't local. So if I asked for the log, it was going to take like a minute to come back. And so I never did. I didn't even know Subversion had a log feature. It was so slow, nobody used it. But with Git, it's local, so it's really fast, so I actually use it, which motivates me to, be to make better log messages, which is also affected by the power that Git gives me to save my work without sharing my work. So now I can say commit, going to lunch, and then I can go back and edit that later. And it's not like public to my team. Uh, so I make better log messages, so I use the log more, and so on. And in the end, I mean, I would never, go back. I need this. I didn't know I needed it until I had it, but now I need it. Another one is uh, continuous delivery because Jez and, and Dan and their team back in the day, they just needed to make deployment more safe and also happen in fewer than two weeks. Um, but as they made it, they put a lot of work into the automation to make deployment faster. And as it became faster, people did it more often. And because they did it more often, it meant smaller units of change, which made deployment safer, which led them to do it more often, which leads to smaller units of change, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to have a couple mechanisms. Rollback is kind of a fiction, but there's, there's degrees. If you have to be able to react to problems that happen in production, and you also need more and more automation to, to feed this cycle. Uh, but that's, that's cool, because it, it changed uh, the trade-off. You used to have to choose between safety and stability. And continuous deployment with this virtuous cycle, or this growth loop, um, it kind of brought those together. And it said the direction of greater safety and greater uh, stability is the same direction. It's deploying smaller changes with really good tooling. So that changed the world. And that's the point of the golden yak. It changes behavior. It changes what people do. And that feeds back into the system and makes it even bigger. The second universal law of software development is McLuhan's Law. We shape our tools, and our tools shape us. What you make easy changes what people do. And that can have a really big impact. On a really small scale, my, uh, one of my personal teeny weeny little baby golden yaks is on any new computer setup, uh, the first three aliases I set up in my bash profile are get status that's totally not relevant to this point. It's just that I can't type without that, so I thought I'd be honest. Um, and then an alias to open my bash profile, where I can then create aliases, and then an alias to reload that bash profile in my current window. I also put good morning at the top so that I have some sort of feedback that it did, in fact, load my bash profile. Uh, but what this does is when I'm typing along and I'm typing along and I'm typing the same thing over and over in that Docker run command, but I, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm memorizing this. I'm getting it into my head. I don't want it in the head. I want in my head. I want it in the world. And suddenly, I have no reason not to create an alias for it. When in doubt, just create an alias because it's easy. So this is a golden yak because it changed my behavior to make me shave more yaks. I made it easier for that, and that was helpful. Uh, another example um, on a, a larger scale of like a team level, project creation. So when I worked at Stripe, this is not true anymore, but at the time, if you wanted to spin up a new service, there was a wiki page for that. 
I printed it out. It was 11 pages. And you could spend anywhere from two days to a week, depending on how many of these uh, steps you already were sure you could skip and whether they went right and stuff like that. And when it takes a week to spin up a new project, you will not spin up a lot of new projects. Uh, when, when you get to the part where you need to add a new web service, a new endpoint, and yeah, a new endpoint, and you could either spin up a new project or add it to an existing service, you know, they might take a day or two to make this new endpoint, you would be irresponsible to spend up to a week spinning up a new project for that. And so you don't. If, if building a new project and setting it up in the build system and the deployment system and everything else is like two commands in Slack, then you're going to base that decision of where to put the new endpoint on what makes sense for the architecture on what makes sense for the future, not just the present. So we're gonna make better, more, more future-oriented decisions because we have automated project creation and made that just as easy as putting, glomming that new endpoint onto some unfortunate victim of an existing service. So it changes behavior. I like to think that with golden yaks, if you shave them well enough, you will find wisdom under their skin. Because I'm like, I didn't really know what difference project creation would make. You can't justify spending a month automating project creation. Um, well, na nowadays that wouldn't take me that long, but back then it would have taken me at least a month to automate all that stuff and understand what was going on. You can't justify that based on time saved when you only start up two new projects a year. I mean, you're, not, you're just not saving a lot of time with that. It would take like at least two years to make up that time. You don't save time. You save attention, and more importantly, well, you also make it accessible to more people, uh, but most importantly, you change people's behavior. And now you might get 10 projects every year, half of which are thrown away because they were experiments. But you kept that experiment out of your production code by making it easier for people to change a project. So that makes it a golden yak. And you find the, the wisdom of, wow, I didn't know how useful it would be to have access to the log. I didn't know how useful good commit messages were. I had no idea how happy my customers would be when I can deploy this feature that took me two days to write two days after they asked me to write it. You, f you learn new things about the world. The trick is always go too far. That's where you'll find the truth. And uh, sometimes that means like playing around on the weekend or sneaking in a little extra work. Um, and you can listen to what Kent talked about and exploring in the keynote a few minutes ago of keep these fast and get the feedback loop of is it really going to help? But you'll be surprised at the ones that do. And the golden yaks will surprise you. Currently, I love my job because I get to work on the, um, the, the imperial royal golden yak of development automation tools where I get to help developers um, I get to write code to help developers write code to help themselves write and deliver code more effectively. Uh, so, so I love it. It's, 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 a, it's a creation tool. So I don't even know how it's going to change behavior in all the different ways. I only know some. And the other thing about yaks is they can be really fun. I mean, if you hate the yak shave, fine, don't do it. But sometimes, it's good to just take it a little farther and play with it a bit and see what you can discover. And in the end, I would like you to remember that while your job is often to shave yaks, uh, you get to define out what to do and how to do it. You get to make the choice. And remember that the world of the yak is so much bigger than how awesomely hairy they are. Thank you.